Yo, what's up everybody? It's Tuna. There's a build that I really enjoy. I think it's like one of the best builds in the game because it is able to pretty much trivialize all of the most difficult content in the game. Um, what you're seeing on screen right now is a T17 map with the, you know, the exile strategy that people are running, which basically is ghosted exiles and they're just dropping a ton of loot because of the scarab that gives you additional rewards from uh, the exiles, you know, in the form of uniques and stuff like that. In addition to it being, you know, within the strong boxes themselves too. And you can see they, they just drop a ton of loot, a ton of uniques. It's kind of like we're back in Affliction League. And so since we're staying in theme with Affliction League, I decided it was time to make a Chieftain again. And um, yeah, it really excels in this kind of content because it is able to basically tank everything that you throw at it and also is able to dish out the damage that is proportional to monster HP in your map, right? So because... Uh, we are fighting monsters with such HP, we can actually use that to our advantage by uh, not only using Detonate Dead, but also using um, the Fulcrum Staff, which is able to then reflect Hinokura's Death Fury, which is Chieftain's Explosion uh, Notable from the Ascendancy. And what that does is essentially lets us carry around an Ignite that deals um, pretty much dot cap damage within this content. And yeah, so long as you're carrying around this Ignite, you will deal a substantial amount of damage to monsters nearby you. So the way I like to think about it is like this build is like a righteous fire, but it actually dealing a ton of damage, as you can see on the screen. You know, this is like by no means uh, trivial content. These guys are super, super tanky. And usually, you know, if you want to be playing something like a, like a bow build or anything like that, not only can you not tank this kind of content, but also you would need very high investment like a mirror bow or something like that, right, to be able to take it on. But once you get to pretty decently high investment with this build, which is what you're seeing on screen, right, this is uh, at a point where I've gotten both Defiance of Destiny as well as a Progenesis, and that's the point where I feel like you can kind of do this content more comfortably. Um, yeah, you can do T17 maps, but before that, of course, it has uses outside of that too, as the build is really, really fast. It uses self-chill as a means to, you know, basically zooming through maps and it has the explosions and proliferations, which feels really, really good when basically just running, sprinting through maps. And um, yeah, it's one of the reasons why I made it as well, because it's quite versatile and it's also an extremely chill type of uh, play style. So if you played it last league, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. And um, yeah, if you made it already past the intro and like the showcase, then let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of the build and how it works. Okay, but before I get too deep into the nitty gritty of how the build works and its mechanics and stuff like that, I wanted to show a little bit of a clip from my stream yesterday, which is basically when I'm in the self chill map zooming setup and what it looks like when you're just, you know, doing normal kind of mapping. Basically, you walk around and you explode stuff, and as soon as they explode, you reflect and ignite onto yourself, and then you can just sprint around and everything around you should explode you can see that it's pretty damn fast so you know you're gonna be you're gonna be zooming through these maps and okay here i managed to actually pick up a speed shrine but yeah the, the the whole thing about the build is that you're just you're just quickly zooming around maps and then you're using your explode to your advantage and that explode is then of course proliferating it too and uh, you're able to do some pretty interesting and fun maps now let's actually skip through a little bit to where i don't have a speed shrine so it's not so deceptive uh, yeah, like the it's it's a really really fun playstyle, and you can use it for basically any content that's mapping related. I feel like it's really good at doing something like you know breach harbingers. Um, what else is it good at? Ultimatum. Uh, it's also pretty damn good at simulacrums too, if you're into that sort of stuff. But it really excels at pretty much anything aside for bossing and legions, right? Those two things are just like awful. They're just god awful. This build does not have any single target whatsoever unless you have carried around an Ignite with you, or unless you are using Vault Breach to then like re-pick up an Ignite to like do a little bit of damage. But yeah, it's like, it's honestly, at those two things, if you want to do either of those two things, do not roll this build. It's just, it's just awful. You don't want to play it. But anything else, you know, mapping related as well as uh, potentially like any other interesting stuff that you might have planned, like it's pretty good at. So yeah, I really enjoyed this build and um, yeah, okay, now let's get into the, into the mechanics. All right, so how does this build work? Well, at the centerpiece, we have the Fulcrum Staff, and this is the absolute most mandatory piece of the build, because without this, in my opinion, it doesn't really function right. There are many other ways that people have built this in the past, but I think for the purpose of how I like to play the game and in general, the type of content that I think this build is suited for, I think the Fulcrum Staff is just absolutely mandatory, right? So this is what enables you to essentially take an ailment uh, that you have inflicted and then reflect it back onto yourself. 
And what this does is it means that you are not only, you know, igniting yourself, but you're also shocking yourself as well as chill and freezing yourself. And you have to have ways to mitigate, you know, shock, freeze and chill. But in terms of ignite that it, we will use to our advantage because we are actually a chieftain and chieftain gets access to um, this right here, which is the Tessalio's cleansing waters, which essentially says, um, you know, unaffected by ignite. And this is a, you know, there has to be a very clear distinction between unaffected and um, immune because when you are avoiding or you are immune, actually what happens is that you are not actually, you're not being inflicted with that ailment. Rather, um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically like you're not actually being inflicted by that ailment, right? But specifically unaffected means that you are inflicted by that ailment, but it is not negatively affecting you. So that is the reason why we can kind of carry around that ignite. And is the reason why we can, you know, basically the whole build works. There are other ways to do this. So it is possible to do this on, for example, Elementalist because it has um, good scaling as well. But you would need to, of course, use boots that give you um, unaffected by Ignite on there as well. But the next thing that's, uh, you know, really crazy about this build is that we are using, uh, it is right here, sorry, the Hinakora's Death Fury, which is kind of the centerpiece, uh, the reason why we can deal with these extremely difficult maps. Uh, enemies ignited. Uh, enemies you or your ki totems kill have a 5% chance to explode, dealing 500% of their life as fire damage. Now, 500% is an insane number, and it's the reason why we can kind of take on the most difficult content because it is scaling with monster HP, and it's actually one of the only explodes in the game that looks at the monster HP itself rather than the corpse HP. And the cool thing about that is that it enables us to use things like Wellspring of Creation on the Atlas Passive Tree to essentially just give us permanent fortify with very little downside, right? The only downside of having something like this is that when you first enter a map, you're actually just dealing zero damage. The build deals no single target damage. I have like maybe a million uh, detonate dead damage. It's, it's very, very, very low, right? So before you're actually reflecting or detonating a, a corpse with IHP, you are basically dealing ZDPS. But as soon as you've ramped, you can basically take on that Ignite for the entire map and you just blast on through. Now, this is only really a concern if you're doing T17 Exile maps because in any other content, everything's just getting one shot and it creates this chain reaction really, really quickly. So it's not a problem at all, right? Um, but in regards to, you know, the rest of the build, things that synergize really well with the build are um, Cloak of Flame because this gives us increased duration of Ignite on enemies and this increased duration of Ignite on enemies is actually reflected back onto us meaning that the Ignite that we reflect back is going to be a longer one so it's just like really really nice quality of life uh, so you can just basically carry that around for longer and uh, it's, it's kind of cool right now, another thing that is uh, a lot of people have had questions about this league is the fact that we are um, not able to actually use the self stun tech anymore to uh, proc our cast when stunned because we are using immutable forces and blood notch, right? But there is this ring, which is, you know, um, kind of uh, not really looked at very often, but it makes it so your stun threshold is based on energy shield instead of life meaning that we can still basically make use of the old mastery instead of uh, have that on a, on a ring, right? And you can get some nice corruptions on this too since it's an extremely common ring. And uh, yeah, and when we pair that, of course, with uh, Agnostic, that means that every hit that is going to hit us, uh, it's going to be a stunning hit. Now, the downside of this, of course, is that you have zero mana at all times since you will be permanently draining. But um, yeah, it, it essentially makes it so that you are technically immune to stunning hits as long as they uh, are not one shots or they're not beyond your max hit. Um, so yeah, we use that to our advantage and to actually have full, uh, you know, small hit immunity, you need to actually have an immutable forces of 961 and above, as well as a blood notch of 60% paired up with um, a level 21 petrified blood. Now, the reason for that is because, um, you know, we want to be able to be tanky against all of small hits. However, if there was one jewel to compromise on, I would actually recommend compromising on the immutable forces as if you get one below 961, all that it's going to do is basically going to make your stuns last for two frames rather than one frame, um, which in many cases is not really like you don't really feel it. However, you know, if you want to actually make the build feel a little bit smoother later on, going for 961 is better. 
Um, and since we are actually not using Defiance of Destiny in the early and self chill versions of the build, we only really want to be using this amulet if we want to blast through T17 maps, um, where we're getting like hit by hundreds of exiles at the same time. That is the only point at which you actually ever need to have Defiance of Destiny. It's something that I bought late yesterday as I was testing the, that type of content. That is, um, yeah, that is when you actually want to be grabbing that instead of um, our other amulet, which uh, which we use, which is the Eternal Damnation. And Eternal Damnation is really nice because it gives us a ton of additional elemental max hit. And what that does is it makes us very, very tanky versus, yeah, elemental damage at the expense of losing some of our Chaos Damage max hit. But uh, we can mitigate a lot of the negative resistance by the use of the Ruby Flask, which now grants 5% maximum fire resistance as opposed to the old 20% uh, less fire damage taken, right? which ends up being kind of like a net neutral in regards to uh, how much mitigation you're getting from that, but it does enable you to use something like the Eternal Damnation to gain an absurd amount of max hits. All right, so how do we self-chill? So self-chilling is um, done by using the Winterweave Coral Ring, and the Winterweave Coral Ring is going to be essentially reflecting, um, you know, it's going to be reversing the chills that we inflict on enemies. And the only way to efficiently chill on this build is by using the Oriat's End. In the past, we could use Vortex on left click, but since that's no longer a thing, Oriat's End is, sent, is like just the best way to do it currently. So if you can't afford Oriat's End, I have provided with multiple POBs in the description showing you from the first, uh, you know, the cheap variant into the self chill variant into the very end game variant that we, you will kind of want to have for farming T17 exile maps. Um, yeah, so the Oriat's End, what it does is it has a 25% chance, uh, you know, at a 20 to 30% chance to explode enemies for 10th of their HP uh, of a random element. So one of those elements is going to be cold. And when that proc is cold, it's going to be reflecting that chill back onto you, giving you a total of 30% um, chill effect, meaning that you will have 30% increased action speed. So all of your movement speed and all and that sort of stuff is going to be multiplied by 30 or not 30, rather, it's going to be multiplied by 1.3. Uh, so yeah, you'll just be walking much, much faster, and it's going to feel pretty good once that procs. And uh, yeah. Now, one question I'll be getting an absolute shit done on stream specifically is the Hand of Farsia, Farsia mesh gloves, which have been introduced this leak. These gloves are uh, funky, right? Because there is actually uh, a mechanic that these gloves have that is basically contradictory to anything else we've ever had in the video game. Now, some people think it's bugged, some people don't think it's bugged. I personally don't really care, I just like cool interactions. So in this regard, like what this interaction is, is specifically this. Uh, the last line that you see there, the unique modifier says, non curse aura from your skills only apply to you and linked targets. Now, in many cases in Path of Exile, do not always overwrite can. So essentially what this is saying is uh, non curse aura effect, can affect you and what generosity is saying non cursor from your skills do not affect the, the can affect you is actually overriding the do not where in other situations it would never actually do that so it's a it's a really weird way to be able to boost your auras by substantial amounts so you can see here that it, i have 90 max fire uh, resistance and that sort of stuff but when i take general cd out it goes to 87 so what's happening is not only am i getting the plus one but i'm also getting an additional 45 percent increased aura effect by linking it to purity of fire as well as determination you know granting me a ton of armor as well so um, you know, whether it's unintended or anything like that, or it's going to get patched, like, I don't think it's going to get patched this, uh, this league, but if it does get patched next league, then, you know, we'll have to adapt then to, to that. But, uh, it's a, it's a really cool and very strong interaction that I am using in this build. And, uh, I think it's really, really good because you can also get like pretty decent corruptions on these. I have plus two aura. So I assume these are going to be very expensive, but of course, in the, you don't need it for like general mapping and T16s. But if you want to be pushing into T17s, every little thing counts because those maps are damn hard, especially if you want to run Exiles. So yeah, getting plus two Aura or plus two AoE or plus one even, it's going to be very beneficial there to get on these gloves for sure. Now for the endgame variant um, into you know to run T17s, I'm using Chaos Binding because I'm able to shift some of the resistance uh, the resistances that I need onto Jewels. And um, yeah, this 
belt essentially gives me a multiplicative increase to my physical damage taken as so additive would obviously be better but we you know we take everything we can get this makes a nearby enemies convert 25 percent of their physical damage to fire and essentially that lets us mitigate more of that physical damage because we are sh you know shifting a lot of that and because we're getting a ton of maximum resistances and stuff like that but it's it is by no means like the best belt you can get i think in some situations mage blood might be better but the thing about mage blood is that it forces you to not be using unique flasks and for the content that i'm running right now i think these unique flasks are very very good for me and um yeah if i i think in the future i might do like a mage blood variant uh, but yeah mage blood is really nice if you actually just want to zoom or you just want to run general t16s and stuff like that but i will look into that uh, in, in a maybe in a future video or like on stream so yeah check that out if uh, if you're interested of course but for now i'm using chaos binding however in the in the cheaper and self chill variants uh, I, i'm using this right so if i'm running t16 maps or any content i'm just looking for a stygian vice with some fire resistance some chaos resistance as well as regen is really nice uh, and just flat life because then I can put a jewel in it that gives me corrupted blood immunity and what that allows me to do is it allows me to swap from Rallakesh into basically anything right so a really strong uh, minor pantheon for this build is going to be uh, soul of growth call because it gives you physical damage reduction for each hit you've taken recently and we have no evasion or anything like that so we've been taking a lot of hits we are proccing our cast when stunned um, many many times or soul of shikari if you are doing maps that have like enemies poison on hit but for me i'm using soul of Rallakesh because yeah i'm not using the belt anymore and i'm not able to put a corrupted blood anywhere else but know that if you do want to actually spare one passive for it you can get corrupted blood immunity here and you can change your uh minor pantheon to basically anything else that you want so yeah take a look at all the pantheons because pantheons are pretty damn strong in this video game but uh the minor ones are going to be very versatile to what you're doing but the major one is always going to be soul of lunaris because this grants us uh, physical damage reduction for each enemy nearby as well as avoid projectiles and reduced elemental damage taken if you've been hit recently which is basically all the time because uh, yeah our build just depends on being hit so having that ma uh, that major pantheon fully upgraded is just insane and absolutely essential to the build and I recommend you guys get that upgraded ASAP. But uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about some of the mechanics and uh, how this all functions. So the fact that we are using a uh, stun setup by the Valerium Ring, reducing our energy shield as well as Blood Notch Immutable Forces, this kind of enables cast when stun support, which basically has a 50% chance to trigger support spells when you are stunned or when you take a blocking stun hit. Meaning uh, we could basically just trigger every spell that is linked to this gem uh, when we are stunned half of the time. Now the reason why I keep this at level 1 is because we have to link everything to life tap support. And life tap support introduces a massive life cost. And if this was triggering every time I was hit, this would basically... <laughs> This would double uh, the amount of life that I spend every, you know, every second or whatever. And you can actually get into troubles where you might end up killing yourself in game due to the, the life cost, right? So you definitely don't want to be leveling this up that much. But you want to also be finding a sweet uh, middle ground between your regen as well as um, the amount of life that you're spending per second when stunned. And we use detonate dead because detonate dead is just broken, everybody knows. And you don't need a level 21 gem because it scales especially uh, only with, um, you know, Spectre or Corpse HP. Uh, we'll just be linking Detonate Dead. And uh, the way that we Desecrate is we just have a secondary cast when stun setup linked to Desecrate. And you definitely want that to be at level 20. And we have Life Tap support here as well so that we can cast our spells. Now we have a Utility 6 link 2, which have like Life Tap support, increased duration, automation efficacy as well as phase run and basically uh, basically what that does is it gives us almost full uptime on phase run but if you want to spend an extra two points to have absolutely full uptime you can do so here so you can click that and then you have the damage over time mastery which gives you increased skill effect duration and increased duration of ailments on enemies that is really good those are really really good um you know nodes that are joined together so you can see that if i was to just uh, i'll just quickly like respect to show you guys i still have to like get my level my character to level 100 but if I was to grab these two points, you see that now I'm going to be having 100% uptime on phase run if it procs again. So that's going to be up 100% of the time now, pretty much. 
And that's, that's, you know, that's essentially where we want to be. Okay, so what modifiers can't this uh, build run? The modifiers that you absolutely do not want to run this build is players cannot regenerate life, mana, or energy shield, negative maximum resistance, which kind of you don't want to be running on any build, less recovery of energy shield and life, as well as chance to avoid ailments, um, because, yeah, that makes you able to not ignite. Now, another one that some people uh, also like to filter out is the aura. Uh, players have reduced effect of non curse auras from your skills because the, yeah, yeah like this one is gonna make it so that you don't have any more maximum resistance and that sort of stuff so uh, yeah definitely try to avoid that one now for t17s there is a lot more modifiers as you guys know t17s just have these disgusting mods that brick basically any build but one that I avoid is players are marked on death for X seconds after killing a rare or unique monster. Since I'm running Exiles, I'll be killing a ton of unique monsters. What this mod does is it makes you not able to recover life anymore. It makes you take increased damage. So it's basically just a brick. Rare monsters in the area are Shaper touched. The reason for that is because once Shaper spawns, he shoots balls at you. And those balls penetrate your resistances. And yeah, they one-shot me. They just, like, they just straight up one-shot me, so... Another modifier is, is players have negative to all maximum resistances. You know, this gets, rolls up to 20%. And with increased effect of uh, of modifiers on my maps, it's just like a disgusting mod. This one's kind of funny, actually. I found this out the hard way, but players have less area of effect. This rolls, because this can roll up to negative 100, meaning that you will literally deal no damage. Uh, like your, your big AoE explosions will not have any AoE whatsoever. And um, yeah you will just be ZDPS, like literally ZDPS. Uh, players are targeted by meteors when they use a flask. It's it's crazy to me that I can't tank this. I tested it and uh, yeah, even one meteor just one shots me with the, with the max hit that I have. It's pretty insane. Oh, you absolutely do not want to be running that. <laughs> or you just want to remove your flasks, right? Uh, this one actually, I don't mind. Players cannot recharge energy shield is not a problem. Uh, players uh, have reduced effect of non curse aura from their skills in T17s. So that's really nasty. It, it basically, yeah, it's like you have no auras. It's not good. Players have less recovery of life and energy shield, as well as monsters damage uh, penetrates X elemental resistances. Because, yeah, if they penetrate us, we're just going to die since a lot of our mitigation comes from having maximum resistances and that sort of stuff. That pretty much sums up the mechanics of the build. And I just want to show you guys the variants that are made for you in path building. So this is the Chief Man Cheap variant. The Chief variant does not use Progenesis. It does not use any expensive flasks. And it does not also use an expensive Elegant Hubris. So the Elegant Hubris is really important because we want to have Supreme Ostentation. Just ignore attribute requirements. And it makes sure that we can actually just um, equip all of our gear. So you can see that if I was to take this off, it would increase my attribute requirements by 159. It would make it impossible for me to actually deal with all of those requirements. The thing that you really want to look for is a Chaos Resistance node. You could spend an extra couple of points here and there to to get one but you can look for a chaos resistance node here here or this here as well it's going to cost you a couple points but know that you don't exactly need it because you can use chaos medium clusters and also you can get student of decay which is a damage over time um, notable on medium clusters too that grants a little bit of chaos resistance also but the way we get a ton of chaos resistance is through the use of a 35 percent increased effect small chaos cluster so we can easily cap our chaos res that way and of course, through our gear as well, because we have uh, free suffixes in the form from our helmet, from our boots and from our belt. And since Chieftain has a very easy access to uh, capping its elemental resistance through uh, the Valakos Storm Embrace that says modifiers to maximum fire resistance also apply to maximum cold and lightning resistance. Uh, this is going to grant us the maximum resistance. And this right here is going to be granting us um, resistances to cold and lightning um, it's going to be boosted by our fire resistance. And since we are using a ruby flask as well as purity of fire, we're going to have an excess of fire resistance and that's going to overflow into our cold and lightning resistance at 50% of its value. And uh, yeah, so you don't really have to worry too much about your other resistances. You only craft fire res on your gear. So you have fire res on helmet gear, on boots and on belt. And that also double dips because we get a uh, access to regeneration 1%, 1 life regeneration per 1% uncapped fire res. And since we have 250% uncapped fire res, that's just like an extra 250 flat regeneration, which is really, really nice. 
And yeah, another thing that Supreme Ostentation enables is it, it enables you to stack these uh, tattoos that we got this league, which are relatively annoying to purchase. But what I did is that, you know, I just stacked a bunch of reduced effective curses on you. So that elemental weakness, as well as um, people or vulnerability, that kind of stuff affects us a lot less. And I just stacked as many of them as possible. And then here I granted a 5% increased chance to ignite. You want that chance to ignite to be at 100%, of course, because you want to be consistently igniting. So make sure that you check your character sheet in game. The way that you do that is you press C, you go to offenses and you scroll all the way down here and it's just say chance to ignite from main hand hits, all right? And you can also see that here in, um, if you click that need dead, but essentially as long as that it's 100%, <clears throat> then it's all good. And uh, you'll just be needing a few of those. And for the rest, I go for 1% block attack hits. Block is really nice. It gives a ton of uh, extra little bit of, um, you know, effective max hit. It allows you to also recover some of the life costs that you incur by casting cast when stunned. And I do that by getting the, st the staff um, nodes here, as well as 2% life reg uh, regained when you um, block with the staff. So it, yeah, that's like an extra little bit of nice recovery that we get from these nodes and something that I recommend grabbing uh, right away but um, this is one of the least prioritized nodes on the tree as it's not actually giving you true max hit rather it's just effective hit pool but it's still really nice and i recommend you grab that uh, because block does actually smooth out the build especially as i said before it smooths out the um, the life cost that you incur now i'll open up the let's just save this one first I'll open up the self chill variant of the build and all that really changes here is that you're grabbing an Oryat's end instead of a magic utility flask and you are of course using increased uh, uh you know immunity is just shock effect on a flask to get our shock reduction because it's really important to get that since we are actually shocking ourselves for max shock with Oryat's end we also do have that I'll, uh, I'll go back to the cheap variant to just make sure that you guys um have caught this too I might have actually done a mistake here. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, we're getting our chill immunity and um, freeze immunity here, as well as our shock immunity from flasks. This does reduce the duration of these flasks, but I put it on the longest flasks possible. That's your ruby and your basalt flask are gonna be the ones that last the longest. So putting it on those is really good because um, yeah, they will still last 6.2 seconds, but since we are absolutely, we need this modifier, gain three charges when you're hit by an enemy, because this build relies on getting hit, and when you're getting hit, you're regenerating flash charges. This, uh, that's the, basically the way it functions. Like you need to have this prefix on your every single one of your flasks, uh, so that you can absolutely guarantee that they're up all the time, no matter what. So yeah, get immunity to shock, immunity to chill, uh, and then movement speed as well as uh, damage taken leads to this life, which is a bit of extra recovery as well as armor. And for the self-chill variant, we swap our Basalt for an Oriat's End so that we can self-chill and we put in a Winterweave Ring instead of a Death Rush to grant us, uh, you know, extra little bit of uh, chill. So when you type chill here and you go for like maximum chill, like 30%, that boosts our movement speed from like a 200%, 168% to 248%. It's, it's kind of crazy amount of uh, movement speed that you get from that. And that's why we're able to zoom through maps the way that we do and it's really satisfying so uh, yeah we go for the winter weave and nothing really much else changes aside for the fact that i started adding a little bit of corruptions here so maybe getting a plus two on your gloves which gets you to 90 percent maximum resistance as well as uh, corruption on your cloak of flame reduced to crit is pretty nice um and those are the two major changes that should cost you a pretty decent amount and you should also really like look for a better jewel here if you can, because in the end end game version of the build, we want to be shifting a lot of the power away from, um, you know, we want to be shifting some more power into our flasks and into this jewel. For example, I would grab the increased chance, uh, the chance to avoid being shocked there. But this jewel is going to be exorbitantly expensive because I'm wearing it. Uh, you know, anything that I wear, people are going to be like trying to like spam by and stuff like that. So I really do advise you guys to maybe take maybe like a minute or two to look at some of the itemization choices and think to yourself, is that really mandatory? Can I, can I, for example, take um, something that he solves in, in, in this item slot and move it somewhere else? And m most of the times the, the answer to that is actually, yes, yes, you can. Um, so for example, like last week, everybody was like panicking about the fact that I had uh, a void shock on that jewel, but 
what they didn't know is that you can just basically grab immunity shock on the flask instead and that would basically just cost you a little bit of regen right it's like it's not a big deal at all to do that uh yeah that's the way that i solved that and in the end game variant which this is basically a snapshot of the moment my build started feeling good in t17 exile maps uh, like all of the modifiers that i can run are filtered out like less regen less recovery and that sort of stuff and yeah this is the moment where the build started actually feeling good and i will just be posting the pop here because it's quite expensive but this is when I actually introduced Progenesis as well as Defiance of Destiny. And at this point, it's the only time that you want to be using Taste of Hate. Because Taste of Hate actually bricks your self-stun. Since any any monster that has cold damage will um, will not stun you, essentially. Because of some like obscure rare mechanic. But uh, because we have Defiance of Destiny, we're recovering our missing life when we're hit by an enemy. Therefore, we can actually just use Taste of Hate to buff our Fizz Max hit even further. Uh, so we, we can introduce that there. And then Progenesis is just going to give us a ton of an extra effective hit pool. Still use Orias End and Kaom's Binding as well. So that is the endgame variant of the build. And essentially everything that you need to know um, uh, about the Fulcrum build. And I hope I didn't miss anything specifically. But if I did, <laughs> let me know in the comments. Otherwise, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. And um, yeah, thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you have a good day. Peace out.